Hi, this is Dr. K from iMedical School, and today we're going to discuss appendicitis. Make sure to subscribe and check out our other free educational videos at our YouTube channel, iMedical School. Appendicitis is one of the most common causes of severe abdominal pain, requiring surgical intervention. Given the severity of symptoms with appendicitis and the fact there are several appendicitis mimics, it is important to understand how to identify as well as manage appendicitis. The appendix is a natural diverticulum at the beginning of the colon. This area of the colon is called the cecum. Within the cecum lies the appendix and the ileocecal valve. Both the appendix opening and the ileocecal valve are used as landmarks in colonoscopy to identify when the colonoscope has reached the full extent of the colon. As a side note, the ileocecal valve is a one-way valve located where the terminal ileum, the last part of the small bowel, empties into the colon. The ileocecal valve allows flow from the small bowel to enter the colon, but prevents content from the colon entering the small bowel. The appendix is located typically at the base of the cecum, but its location can vary from one person to another, making diagnosing appendicitis difficult. The layers of the appendix consist of the innermost mucosal layer, then deep to that mucosal layer is the submucosa. In the submucosa, there are prominent collections of B and T cells. The large collections of immune or lymphoid cells distinguishes the appendix from other portions of the colon. Below the submucosa is the muscularis propria that consists of an inner circular smooth muscle layer and an outer longitudinal smooth muscle layer. Lastly, there's a thin serosal layer that covers the external portion of the appendix. Appendicitis is most commonly seen in males ranging from 10 to 30 years old, but it affects females just as nearly as frequent. Appendicitis is an inflammation of the appendix that can lead to a localized abscess and even perforation. There are several causes that are believed to lead to appendicitis. The most common cause is believed to be obstruction of the outlet of the appendix. However, a majority of cases of non-perforated appendicitis are not associated with obstruction. In those cases where obstruction is the underlying cause, Hard stool, tumors, and infectious processes tend to be the culprits. Obstruction leads to increased pressure in the appendix and decreases the outflow of lymph fluid. The increased pressure leads to ischemia due to clot formation and stasis in the small blood vessels of the appendix. Obstruction is believed to be the cause of appendicitis in those who are older and develop appendicitis, while those that are younger are believed to develop appendicitis due to obstruction from activation of lymphoid tissue from infection. Typical symptoms of appendicitis begin as an acute dull pain around the belly button. Sudden decreases in appetite with nausea and vomiting may also be seen. In some, the pain migrates from around the belly button to the right lower quadrant, but this only may occur in about half of those with appendicitis. Other less specific symptoms include diarrhea, fatigue, fever, and indigestion. The key to diagnosing appendicitis is imaging and lab work, but a commonly tested aspect of appendicitis are physical exam findings. It is important to understand that these physical exam findings should not sway your opinion regarding evaluation for appendicitis, but they can be helpful in further supporting your diagnosis. The first physical exam sign is called McBurney's point. Imagine drawing a line from the anterior superior iliac spine to your umbilicus or belly button. Locate the anterior superior iliac spine by feeling around your hip. You should feel a bony prominence towards the front of your body. If you draw a line from there to your belly button and travel about two inches from the anterior superior iliac spine to the belly button along this line, you will identify McBurney's point. Focal tenderness at this point can be indicative of appendicitis. There are three other signs that you can elicit on physical exam. The first is Rovsing sign. Rovsing sign is when you press the left lower quadrant, but the patient feels right lower quadrant pain. The second sign is called the psoas sign. 
you ask the patient to lay on their left side with their right side up in the air. Then they push their right leg backward against resistance. The extension of the hip against resistance engages the psoas muscle. For those who have a retrocecal appendix, which is when the appendix folds over the backside of the cecum, lying near the psoas muscle, engagement of the psoas may irritate the retrocecal appendix. The last sign is called the obturator sign, and it is useful in someone who has a pelvic appendix, where the appendix hangs lower, crossing near the fallopian tubes, rectum, or ureter. A pelvic appendix may lie next to the right obturator internus muscle. So the theory is very similar to the theory behind the psoas sign. The patient lays on their back and rotates the lower right leg with assistance from the examiner while the examiner holds the knee bent and in place. This maneuver engages the right obturator internus and theoretically, if a pelvic appendix lies next to this muscle, it should cause pain. Again, I want to reiterate that these physical exam findings are good to understand, but they should not dissuade you from further valuing for appendicitis, as your sensitivity and specificity in diagnosing appendicitis is quite low. I believe the most important factors in diagnosing appendicitis are the characteristics of the pain, lab work, and imaging. If someone is having sudden onset of pain and they look uncomfortable, getting lab work and a CT scan should be your next step, not doing special physical exam maneuvers. Besides a history and physical, labs are important in diagnosis of appendicitis. Appendicitis is commonly associated with an elevated white blood cell count. An elevated white blood cell count has a sensitivity of 80%. So there are people who present early on with appendicitis who may have a normal white blood cell count. In addition, an elevated lactate can be seen, but is by no means specific in diagnosing appendicitis. One of the key components for diagnosing appendicitis is imaging. Generally, a CT scan with contrast is the preferred method of imaging appendicitis. The features that are key to diagnosis are a thickened appendiceal wall greater than 2 millimeters, fat stranding around the appendix indicative of inflammation, increased enhancement of the appendiceal wall, and if a blockage is present, then the presence of an appendicolith, though this is not seen commonly. Though a CT scan with contrast is a good modality for diagnosing appendicitis, there are instances when you want to consider other imaging options. First, if someone is sensitive to iodinated contrast or has renal insufficiency, then obtaining a CT without contrast would be acceptable. For children and pregnant women, ultrasound may be a good choice, but if negative and there is a high clinical suspicion or there are equivocal findings on the ultrasound, a MRI should be definitely pursued. The advantages of ultrasound and MRI is that they avoid radiation exposure for those groups particularly sensitive to radiation. Imaging is important to diagnose appendicitis, but also imaging can identify complicated appendicitis. Complicated appendicitis is associated with perforation, gangrene, or an abscess formation. In complicated appendicitis, controlling the underlying infection is very important. Finally, we come to treatment of appendicitis. The first step in treating appendicitis is to start broad-spectrum antibiotics, like cefazolin and metronidazole to cover both your gram-positive organisms and your gram-negatives, particularly your anaerobic gram-negative organisms. If there are features of complicated appendicitis, the use of zosin can be considered. In the end, the gold standard in treatment of appendicitis is a laparoscopic appendectomy. Laparoscopic surgery has distinct advantages to open surgery. Laparoscopic surgery decreases recovery time, morbidity, and mortality. After surgery is completed, a decision needs to be made regarding post-operative antibiotics. If the appendicitis was uncomplicated with good control of the infection during surgery, post-operative antibiotics are not indicated. In those with complicated appendicitis or those where the control of the infection was not adequate, 
antibiotics may be needed postoperatively for several days. In more recent years, the option of pure medical management with antibiotics and fluids has been proposed. While treating with antibiotics alone can be offered for those who are younger and have uncomplicated appendicitis, there are several concerns with this approach. First, even if someone has initial improvement with antibiotics, the recurrence rate for appendicitis is as high as 38%. In addition, given an appendiceal malignancy or cancer can cause appendicitis, though rare, it is concerning if the appendix is not removed to confirm the malignancy is not the underlying cause. If non-operative management is chosen, the person should be watched in the hospital for several days and should see improvement very quickly. Otherwise, operative management should be chosen. The last point I would like to make is to keep an open mind about what is causing symptoms that may mimic appendicitis. Other diagnoses that should be entertained include Crohn's disease, right-sided diverticulitis, endometriosis, tube ovarian abscess, and ovarian torsion, to name a few. It's always important to keep a broad differential in mind and use the history, physical, labs, and imaging to come to a reasonable diagnosis. Well, that was a brief review of appendicitis. If you liked our video, give it a like. Make sure to share it with your friends and classmates. If you have any questions or comments, place them down below, and most importantly, subscribe. This is Dr. K from My Medical School, and I'll see you next time.